Computer security, more recently known as cybersecurity, is an attribute of a computer system. The primary attribute that system builders focus on is correctness. They want their systems to behave as specified under expected circumstances. If I'm developing a banking website, I'm concerned that when a client specifies a funds transfer of, say, $100 for one of her accounts, then $100 is indeed transferred if the funds are available. If I'm developing a word processor, I'm concerned that when a file is saved and reloaded, that I do get back my data from where I left off, and so on. A secure computer system is one that prevents specific, undesirable behaviors under wide-ranging circumstances. Where correctness is largely about what a system should do, security is about what it should not do, even when there is an adversary who is actively and maliciously trying to circumvent any protective measures that you might put in place. There are three classic security properties that systems usually attempt to satisfy. Violations of these properties constitute undesirable behavior. These are broad properties. Different systems will have specific instances of some of these properties, depending on what the system does. The first property is confidentiality. If an attacker is able to manipulate the system so as to steal resources or information, such as personal attributes or corporate secrets, then he has violated confidentiality. The second property is integrity. If an attacker is able to modify or corrupt information kept by a system, or is able to misuse the system's functionality, then he has violated the system's integrity. Example violations include the destruction of records, the modification of system logs, the installation of unwanted software like spyware, and more. The final property is availability. If an attacker compromises a system so as to deny service to legitimate users, for example to purchase products or to access bank funds, then the attacker has violated the system's availability. Few systems today are completely secure, as evidenced by the constant stream of reported security breaches that you may have seen in the news. In 2011, for example, the RSA Corporation was breached. I'll say more about how in a moment. The adversary was able to steal sensitive tokens related to RSA's Secure ID devices. These tokens were then used to break into companies that use Secure ID. In late 2013, Adobe Corporation was breached, and both source code and customer records were stolen. At around the same time, attackers compromised Target's point-of-sale terminals and were able to steal around 40 million credit and debit card numbers. And these are just a few high-profile examples. How did the attackers breach these systems? Many breaches begin with the exploitation of a vulnerability in the system in question. A vulnerability is a defect that an adversary can exploit through carefully crafted interactions to get the system to behave insecurely. In general, a defect is a problem in the design or implementation of the system such that it fails to meet its requirements. In other words, it fails to behave correctly. A flaw is a defect in the design while a bug is a defect in the implementation. A vulnerability is a defect that affects security relevant behavior rather than simply correctness. As an example, consider the RSA 2011 breach. This breach hinged on a defect in the implementation of Adobe Flash Player. Where the Flash Player should benignly reject malformed input files, the defect instead allowed the attacker to provide a carefully crafted input file that could manipulate the program to run code of the attacker's choice. This input file could be embedded in a Microsoft Excel spreadsheet so that Flash Player was automatically invoked when the spreadsheet was open. In the actual attack, the adversary sent such a spreadsheet to an executive at the company. The email masqueraded as being from a colleague, so the executive was beguiled into opening that file. This sort of faked email is called a spear phishing attack, and it's quite common. Once the spreadsheet was open, the attacker was able to silently install malware on the executive's machine, and from there, carry out the attack. This example highlights an important distinction between viewing software through the lens of correctness and through the lens of security. From the point of view of correctness, the flash vulnerability is just a bug, and all non-trivial software has bugs. Companies admit to shipping their software with known bugs because it would be too expensive to fix them all. Instead, developers focus on the bugs that would arise in typical situations. The bugs that are left, like the flash vulnerability, come up rarely, and users are used to dealing with them when they do. 
If doing something causes their software to crash, users quickly learn that that something is not something to do and they work around it. Eventually, a bug is so burdensome on many users that a company will fix it. Now, on the other hand, from the point of view of security, it is not sufficient to judge the importance of a bug only with respect to typical use cases. Developers must consider atypical misuse cases because this is exactly what the adversary will do. Whereas a normal user might trip across a bug and cause the software to crash, an adversary will attempt to reproduce that crash, understand why it is happening, and then manipulate the interaction to turn that crash into an exploitation. In short, to ensure that a system meets its security goals, we must strive to eliminate bugs and design flaws. We must think carefully about those properties that must always hold no matter what, and ensure our design and implementation does not contain defects that would compromise security. We must also design the system so that any defects that do inevitably remain are harder to exploit. So far we have talked about computer security generally, but what is software security, the subject of this class in particular? Software security is a branch of computer security that focuses on the secure design and implementation of software. In other words, it focuses on avoiding software vulnerabilities, flaws and bugs. While software security overlaps with and complements other areas of computer security, it is distinguished by its focus on a secure system's code. This focus makes it a white box approach where other approaches are more black box. They tend to ignore the software's internals. Why is software security's focus on the code important? The short answer is that software defects are often the root cause of security problems, and software security aims to address these defects directly. Other forms of security tend to ignore the software and build up defenses around it, just like the walls of a castle. These defenses are important and work up to a point. But when software defects remain, clever attackers often find a way to bypass those walls. We'll now consider a few standard methods for security enforcement and see how their black box nature presents limitations that software security techniques can address. Our first example is security enforcement by the operating system, or OS. When computer security was growing up as a field in the early 1970s, the operating system was the focus. To the operating system, the code of a running program is not what is important. Instead, the OS cares about what the program does, that is, its actions as it executes. These actions, called system calls, include reading or writing files, sending network packets, and running new programs. The operating system enforces security policies that limit the scope of system calls. For example, the OS can ensure that Alice's programs cannot access Bob's files, or that untrusted user programs cannot set up trusted services on standard network ports. The operating system security is critically important, but it is not always sufficient. In particular, some of the security relevant actions of a program are too fine grained to be mediated as system calls, and so the software itself needs to be involved. For example, a database management system, or DBMS, is a server that manages data whose security policy is specific to an application that is using that data. For an online store, for example, a database may contain security-sensitive account information for customers and vendors, alongside other records such as product descriptions, which are not security-sensitive at all. It is up to the DBMS to implement security policies that control access to this data, not the OS. Operating systems are also unable to enforce certain kinds of security policies. Operating systems typically act as an execution monitor, which determines whether to allow or disallow a program action based on current execution context and the program's prior actions. However, there are some kinds of policies, such as information flow policies, that, cannot be, that simply cannot be enforced precisely without consideration of potential future actions or even non-actions. Software level mechanisms can be brought to bear in these cases, perhaps in cooperation with the OS. We will consider information flow policies in more depth later in this class. Another popular sort of security enforcement mechanism is a network monitor, like a firewall or intrusion detection system, or IDS. 
A firewall generally works by blocking connections and packets from entering the network. For example, a firewall may block all attempts to connect to a network's servers except those listening on designated ports, such as TCP port 80, the standard port for web servers. Firewalls are particularly useful when there is software running on the local network that is only intended to be used by local users. An intrusion detection system provides more fine-grained control by examining the contents of network packets, looking for suspicious patterns. For example, to exploit a vulnerable server, an attacker may send a carefully crafted input to that server as a network packet. An IDS can look for such packets and filter them out to prevent the attack from taking place. Firewalls and IDSs are good at reducing the avenues for attack and preventing known vectors of attack, but both devices can be worked around. For example, most firewalls will allow traffic on port 80 because they assume it is benign web traffic. But there is no guarantee that port 80 only runs web servers, even if that's usually the case. In fact, developers have invented SOAP, which stands for Simple Object Access Protocol, to work around firewall blocking on ports other than port 80. SOAP permits more general purpose message exchanges, but encodes them using the web protocol. Now, IDS patterns are more fine-grained and are more able to look at the details of what's going on than our firewalls. But IDSs can be fooled as well by inconsequential differences in attack patterns. Attempts to fill those gaps by using more sophisticated filters can slow down traffic, and attackers can exploit such slowdowns by sending lots of problematic traffic, creating a denial of service, that is, a loss of availability. Finally, Consider antivirus scanners. These are tools that examine the contents of files, emails, and other traffic on a host machine, looking for signs of attack. These are quite similar to IDSs, but they operate on files and have less stringent performance requirements as a result. But they, too, can often be bypassed by making small changes to attack vectors. Now we conclude our comparison of software security to black box security with an example, the Heartbleed bug. Heartbleed is the name given to a bug in version 1.0.1 of the OpenSSL implementation of the Transport Layer Security Protocol, or TLS. This bug can be exploited to get the buggy server running OpenSSL to return portions of its memory. The bug is an example of a buffer overflow, which we will consider in detail later in this course. Let's look at black box security mechanisms and how they fare against Heartbleed. Operating system enforcement and antivirus scanners can do little to help. For the former, an exploit that steals data does so using the privileges normally granted to a TLS-enabled server, so the OS can see nothing wrong. For the latter, the exploit occurs while the TLS server is executing, therefore leaving no obvious traces in the file system. Basic packet filters used by IDSs can look for signs of exploit packets. The FBI issued signatures for the Snort IDS soon after Heartbleed was announced. These signatures should work against basic exploits, but exploits may be able to apply variations in packet format, such as chunking, to bypass the signatures. In any case, the ramifications of a successful attack are not easily determined because any exfiltrated data will go back on the encrypted channel. Now, compared to these, software security methods would aim to go straight to the source of the problem by preventing or more completely mitigating the defect in the software. Now, we're going to take a tour of what you will learn in this course. The target audience for the course is those people involved or interested in developing secure software. This includes people who design software systems, who write code to implement those systems, who review code and designs that aim to be secure, and who test software to make sure it's secure. This course is one of several in the Maryland Cybersecurity Center's series of courses in Coursera's cybersecurity specialization. At various points, it will overlap with topics covered in the other courses, which include usable security, cryptography, and hardware security. Now that said, much of our focus will be on the core activities of building software, from designing its architecture to 
writing its code, to testing and otherwise checking that the code is secure. We assume, as a result, that students taking the course have a substantial background in computer science. This is a technical class. As a rough estimate, Students should have had the equivalent background of a third-year university student whose major is computer science or a related field. More specifically, we assume the participants have a fair amount of experience writing code. Ideally, we're looking for the equivalent of three semester-long courses on programming. Two of these courses might consider high-level languages like Java or Ruby or Python. But at least one should be on low-level programming in C and C++. Along with the language features that are common to both C and other languages, in particular to, to C, we assume students are familiar with constructs like arrays and pointers, and with C's approach to memory management using the stack and heap. These concepts are critical to really understanding certain sorts of pernicious security vulnerabilities. We also assume some familiarity with the following material, for which we'll provide some introductory review. Our labs will be implemented in an environment running Linux, so we assume familiarity with Linux basics like the command shell. We will also use the GDB program debugger for one of our labs, and so some knowledge of it will be helpful. We assume students are familiar with the World Wide Web and some basic networking concepts. And finally, we assume students have some familiarity with assembly language, preferably Intel x86 assembly. We expect the students to understand the basics of machine instructions and how processors execute them, but we will do some review of the standard architectural memory model as it pertains to memory-based attacks. Our goal in this class is to learn how to make software that is more secure. We want to learn how to make better designs, write better implementations, and have better assurance at the end that the software we've written is resilient to attack. So how can we go about learning how to do this? We're going to take on two points of view when looking at software security, black hat and white hat. Black hat takes on the point of view of the adversary, white hat of the defender. So a black hat is going to ask, what are the security relevant defects that constitute vulnerabilities in our software? And how can those defects be exploited? Putting on our white hat, we're going to ask, how do we prevent security relevant defects before we deploy? How do we make vulnerabilities we don't manage to avoid harder to exploit? Looking at just one hat or the other only gives us part of the picture. Therefore, during the course, we will wear both hats, switching from one to the next. We'll begin wearing our black hat, looking at low level vulnerabilities in programs written in C and C. These vulnerabilities include many things, most notably buffer overflows, which can take place on the stack or the heap, or due to integer overflow, or overwriting or overreading buffers in memory. We'll also look at format string mismatches and dangling pointer to references. These vulnerabilities lead to attacks like stack smashing or format string attacks or return oriented programming. All of them are violations of a property called memory safety, where accesses to memory via pointers go to memory that they don't own and instead go to other parts of the program. The easiest way to ensure memory safety and thereby avoid these different sorts of attacks is to use what's called a memory safe programming language, or better yet, a type safe programming language. If you still want to use C and C++, which are not memory safe, then there are several automated defenses that will help prevent or mitigate attacks. We'll discuss several. Stack canaries, non-executable data, address space layout randomization, memory safety enforcement, and control flow integrity. And we'll discuss how to augment these defenses using safe programming patterns and libraries. One key idea in these programming patterns and libraries is to validate untrusted input and therefore prevent certain sorts of attacks. Next, we'll turn our attention to securing the World Wide Web. Much of what we do today is on the web, and as a result, it's also the target of attack. The web brings with it new vulnerabilities and attacks, and we'll discuss several, including SQL injection, cross-site scripting, cross-site request forgery, 
and session hijacking. We'll also look at the defenses against these attacks, and we'll see that they have a similar theme to defenses we've seen to this point. For example, we should be careful who or what we trust by validating input, and we should try to reduce any possible damage of attack by making exploitation harder. Now at this point we'll have considered the web and low-level software, but we'll want to step back and look at the software development process generally. How are the ideas and attacks that we've seen to this point relevant to the overall software development process? So we'll look at the different phases of software development life cycles, including requirements, design, implementation, and testing and assurance. And we'll look at the corresponding activities that take security to heart. For example, defining security requirements and defining abuse cases. Performing architectural risk analysis and threat modeling and using a security-conscious design. We'll also want to conduct code reviews, perform risk-based security testing, and perform penetration testing to make sure that the software that we have designed and built truly is secure. Let's look at a couple of the phases now of the life cycle in a bit more detail. For requirements and design, we'll look at how to identify sensitive data and resources and define security requirements for them. These requirements include things we've mentioned already, like confidentiality, integrity, and availability. We'll consider the expected threats against our system and the abuse cases that could violate the requirements we've set down. Next, we'll apply principles for secure software design to prevent, mitigate, and detect possible attacks. There are several different principles and rules that we'll use, but basically three main categories. First, favor simplicity in your design and code. Second, trust components with reluctance. And third, defend in depth, relying not on one defense, but many. At the end, as an exemplar of this sort of design practice, we'll look closely at the very secure FTP daemon. It was written very much with security in mind and employs many of the principles that we've just mentioned. Next, we'll turn our attention to the implementation and testing phase and focus on rules and tools. In particular, we'll apply coding rules to implement our secure design. These rules will have similar goals to the principles we've looked at, that is, preventing, mitigating, or detecting possible attacks. We'll also look at how to apply automated code review techniques to find potential vulnerabilities in components. In particular, we'll look at a technique called static analysis that is able to analyze a program and consider all of its possible executions when making a judgment. We'll also look at symbolic execution, which is a sort of hybrid technique between static analysis and testing, and it underlies a technique called white box fuzz testing. Finally, we'll look at applying penetration testing to find potential flaws in a real system in a deployment environment. We'll look at different attack patterns as enabled by different sorts of pen testing tools. And we'll look at a technique called fuzz testing for trying to find failure scenarios in software programs. Stepping back, we can see that the content of this course has six overall units. The first is memory attacks, followed by memory defenses, looking at low-level software. Next, we look at web security. We follow that with secure design and development. Then we dig into automated code review via static analysis and symbolic execution, and finally finish up with techniques for penetration testing, notably fuzzing. You can expect about 80 minutes of video per week for six weeks. We'll also have some supplemental readings and interviews from the experts. I've managed to put together interviews with four experts, here we see Andy Chow, a static analysis expert, and the CTO of Coverity, a company that makes a static analysis product. We also see Gary McGraw, who is a software security expert and noted author, and he's the CTO of Sigital Incorporated. I should say many of the ideas that I put forth in this course are inspired by Gary's books, and I was really pleased to interview him. Next, we'll hear from Eric Ames, who's a penetration testing expert and is a principal security consultant for the Fusion X company, and Patrice Godefroy, a white box fuzzing expert, who is a principal researcher at Microsoft Research. <laughs>
We'll assess your understanding of the material in the course in two ways. First, we'll provide projects that should help you get a better grasp of the things that we're talking about, like vulnerabilities and how to exploit them, how to use tools to better build software securely, and so on. And we'll have quizzes once per week that check your knowledge directly using tests. These quizzes will also cover things that you should have learned by doing the projects. That concludes our introduction, so let's get on with learning about software security. In this unit, we will consider low-level software security, which is a concern for systems written in the C and C++ programming languages. We will begin by considering the infamous buffer overflow attack, which low-level software is vulnerable to in particular. What is a buffer overflow? A buffer overflow is a bug that affects low-level code, typically written in C and C++, with significant security implications. Normally, a program with this bug will simply crash, but an attacker can alter the situation and cause the program to do much worse, allowing the attacker to steal private information, to corrupt important data, and even to run code of his choice. It is worth studying buffer overflows for several reasons. First, they are still relevant today. C and C++ are used to write a lot of software, and that software often has buffer overflow vulnerabilities. Second, during their long history, attackers and defenders have played a game of cat and mouse. As defenders address one weakness, attackers find a way to work around it. We will find it instructive to understand the technical details of that long history, to see how the attack works and how to defend against it. Lessons we learn here will be relevant to other software weaknesses. So, let's dig in a little bit further to the relevance and history of buffer overflows. First, this chart shows that C and C++ are still very relevant today. The chart comes from a recent study done by IEEE Spectrum magazine. To come up with their ranking, they looked at new and active open source projects hosted on sites like GitHub, and also looked at Google keyword searches, among other data. Considered altogether, the evidence puts C and C++ as two of the top three languages used today. Therefore, any vulnerabilities particular to these languages, as buffer overflows are, are quite relevant to a good understanding of cybersecurity. What software is written in C and C++? Some examples include operating system kernels, high-performance servers, such as web servers and database servers, and embedded systems, which appear in cars, airplanes, industrial control systems, and even the Mars rover. These systems are all of critical importance. They are the platform for computing, and they drive our economy and ourselves from here to there. A successful attack on these systems has tremendous consequences. The first buffer overflow attack occurred in 1988 and was carried out by a student named Robert Morris. This attack was part of a self-propagating computer worm that replicated itself across the internet. Once it compromised one system, it would gain a foothold there and try to launch an attack against other systems. The attack worked in part by sending a special string to a server called FingerD that was vulnerable to a buffer overflow. This string contained code that would help carry out the attack. In the end, the attack infected a significant portion, around 10%, of the nascent internet, causing a tremendous amount of damage due to denial of service. Morris was eventually caught and had to pay a fine, serve three years probation, and carry out 400 hours of community service. Since the Morris worm, many other worms have been developed, some of which have exploited buffer overflows. One example is Code Red, which came out in 2001. It exploited the vulnerability in Microsoft's IIS web server and spread rapidly across the much larger internet. In fact, the worm was one of the elements that prompted Bill Gates, then chairman of Microsoft, to write his now famous memo exhorting the company to take security far more seriously, 
and to develop a platform for trustworthy computing systems. Unfortunately for Microsoft, another big attack occurred in 2003 with the SQL slammer worm infecting a huge number of machines running Microsoft's SQL Server. The infections took place in a matter of minutes. Changing the culture and practices at a huge organization like Microsoft takes time. Microsoft has made significant strides since that time and many of the practices and ideas that we will consider in this course are ones that they developed or that they have taken to heart. Now buffer overflows are pernicious. As evidence, consider that in early 2014, a buffer overflow vulnerability was discovered in the code of the X11 server, which was an early leader for standardized support for graphical desktop displays, and it forms the foundation of remote desktop technology today. That bug that was discovered in 2014 had been latent in the source code for more than 20 years. And indeed, despite the increased knowledge of how dangerous buffer overflows are and the attention paid toward defending them, the number of reported vulnerabilities continues to rise. So here's what we'll do. For the rest of this unit, we will learn how buffer overflows work and then learn various ways to defend against them. For a complete understanding, we'll need to look at how a compiler produces executable code from C source programs, and how the operating system and architecture work together to run these programs. We'll see that knowing these details, an attacker can exploit bugs in how the program utilizes memory in order to attack that program. In general, security often requires a whole system's view, and our study here will be an example of that. Before proceeding, I'd like to make a note about terminology. I use the term buffer overflow to mean any access of a buffer outside of its allotted bounds. This access could be an overread or it could be an overwrite. It could occur during iteration across each element of the buffer, for example, running off the end, or by a direct access through a direct index of the buffer. The out-of-bounds access could be to addresses in memory that either precede or follow the buffer. All of these things I'll consider broadly as a buffer overflow. Now others sometimes use different terms to refer to specific instances of buffer overflow that I have listed above. They might reserve the term buffer overflow to refer only to actions that write beyond the bounds of a buffer. And they might use terms like buffer underflow, buffer overread, or out-of-bounds access to be more specific. Throughout this course, when I use the phrase buffer overflow, I use it typically in the most general sense, and more specific uses can be determined from context. Before we can talk about how buffer overflows work, we need to review some details about how you run a program on a modern computer. For understanding buffer overflows, we're particularly interested in how programs are laid out in memory. We will consider where the program code and its data are located in memory. We will look at the call stack and how it stores arguments and local variables of functions when they are called. We will look at some of the metadata that is stored amongst this program data to make it easier for the compiler to generate code that can be used in different circumstances. For example, no matter which function calls which other function. In our discussion, we focus on the Linux operating system process model running on an Intel x86 32 or 64 bit processor. While the details differ for different operating systems and architectures, the concepts that we will consider are very similar. All programs are stored in memory. A program, when it begins running, is called a process, and that process is given memory by the operating system in order to run. Here we depict the process's address space. At the bottom is address 0, the lowest address, and at the top is the address at 4 gigabytes, which is the highest address on a 32-bit system. The process's view of memory is that it owns all of it. As far as it can tell, it's the only program running on a system. In reality, these are virtual addresses that the operating system and processor map to actual physical addresses for the memory on the machine. 
At the bottom of the address space is the text segment, or code. Here we see some x86 instructions that might make up the code of our program. Just above the text segment is the data segment, and it has two parts. The first is the initialized data area. So here we see variable y that's initialized to 10. Above that is the uninitialized data area. Here, the variable x is not initialized at all. However, note that global variables not initialized by the program are assured by the process model to be zero. This is not true of uninitialized local variables, as we'll see later. All of this data is known at compile time, so the compiler can determine where it goes and can specify as much in the executable. At the top of the address space comes the command line arguments and environment variables, and these are set when the process starts. Just below them is the stack. The stack is what holds local variables, along with metadata that the program uses to call and return from functions. Above the data segment is the heap. This is the area that malloc manages. All of this data is organized and managed at runtime. That is, how it behaves depends on what the program does, what it interacts with, what input files it reads or writes, and so on. Now we've turned the picture on its side, so the lowest address is to the left and the highest address is to the right, and we'll use this orientation for most of the rest of the slides. Here again we see the stack and the heap depicted, and we also show the direction that they grow. As more memory is needed in the heap, it grows towards the higher addresses, where as more memory is needed for the stack, it grows downward toward the lower addresses. While the program is running, it maintains a stack pointer which indicates the top of the stack. When the program issues a push instruction, it will move the stack pointer after pushing the value. Now, suppose that after running for a while, the function that had pushed these values returns. In that case, we expect that the function will pop a large portion of the stack off, removing all of its local variables and arguments. We'll see how this works exactly in a minute. The compiler emits the instructions that adjust the stack at runtime. Likewise, code, that is the implementation of malloc, keeps track of the heap. The memory that the heap uses is apportioned by the OS, but the individual data that's stored inside of the heap is managed by malloc. For now, we're going to focus on the stack because that's the target of the first attack that we'll consider. The next question is, how does a program use the stack while it is running? As mentioned earlier, the stack is used to support calling and returning from functions. We'll now look at the details. In particular, we'll look at what data we need to store and where we'll put it when calling a function. We'll also look at what has to happen when a function returns, that is, what data needs to be restored and where to get it from. Now let's consider the basic stack layout. Here we see a simple function, func, that takes three arguments, arg1, arg2, and arg3, and has two local variables, loc1 and loc2. Below, we see the depiction of the memory of the process. The highest addresses are to the right, as usual, and we see a depiction of the caller's data, that is, the caller of this function. When the caller goes to call this function, it's going to push the arguments in reverse order of the code. So remember, the stack grows from the right to the left, that is, the top addresses to the bottom addresses. So we see then that arg3 comes first, then arg2, then arg1, that is, the opposite order of the program. Now, the local variables of the function are, al are accessed um, on the stack as well and they are stored in the order that they appear in the program text, that is first loc1 and then loc2. There are a couple bits of information that are stored in between, and we'll see what these are in a moment. Now suppose the compiler is generating code to access these variables. So here we show that within the function it wants to increase the value of loc2 by 1. How will it do this? Well, 
In order to do it, it needs to know where loc2 is stored on the stack. Suppose, for argument's sake, that it's stored at this particular address. How will the program know that? Well, if we think about it, if this function could be called from many different places in the program, the actual address of loc2 could differ depending on who called the function. Therefore, the compiler cannot know this address at compile time, and it's going to need to do something else. Fortunately, the compiler always knows the relative address of this variable. That is, it's always 8 bytes before the question marks here on the stack. Stepping back, we can think of all of this stuff that's highlighted in blue as the stack frame for the function. The arguments and the local variables, plus these extra question marks that we'll get to in a minute. Now, because we want to know how to locate local variables, and for that matter, how to locate arguments, we need a reference point within the stack frame. We'll call that the frame pointer. Typically, compilers store the frame pointer in the EBP register. Therefore, the compiler knows that no matter where this function is called from, it will always be 8 bytes distant from the current value of the frame pointer. Now let's see how we implement returning from functions. Here we see main, which is called the function func that we were just looking at, and we see the stack frame for func here at the bottom of the slide. Here's the caller's data for main that we've saved. Now when we called func, main was using the frame pointer, just as func is, to access its own local variables. When we return from func, main is going to want to use the same frame pointer that it had before so that when it goes to access its variables it's going to the right addresses. So the question is how do we save and restore the frame pointer so that this works properly? Well let's think about how main is going to call func in the first place. What it will do is it will push its three arguments arg3, arg2, arg1, here hey 10, minus 3. It'll push some other data that we'll see in a minute at this point, the stack frame pointer is right here. Now what we can do is we can save main's frame pointer right on the stack. At this point, we can update the frame pointer to be the current stack pointer. And now when the func function starts to run, it will push its local variables after the current stack pointer. And here we are from where we started. The next question is, how do we resume at the same place that we were in, in main, when we called func? Here's what's going on. As main is running, the instruction pointer, EIP, is moving through the different instructions that implement main. Now it goes to call func. When it goes to call it, the, the instruction pointer is going to move up and start executing these different instructions. So what we want is to resume back to where we were when we called the function. Well, we can play the same trick that we did with the frame pointer. We can store the instruction pointer just before calling the function on the stack. Now, when we go to return, we just have to set the instruction pointer to 4 off of the current frame pointer in the call e. In summary, when calling a function, we push arguments onto the stack in reverse order, then we push the return address, and then we jump to the function's address. Within the called function, we push the old frame pointer onto the stack. We set the new frame pointer value to be where the stack is right now, and then push the local variables in order. Finally, to return, we set the previous stack frame by restoring the frame pointer and then we simply jump back to the instruction pointer that we saved on the stack, which is four more than the reset stack pointer, which was set to be the previous frame pointer. Now that we're refreshed on the basics of how C programs are laid out in memory, in particular, how they use the stack to support calling and returning from functions, we can start looking at buffer overflow attacks. Let's look at the components of the name. 
A buffer is simply a contiguous region of memory associated with a program variable or field. When they use the term buffer, people are often thinking of strings, where a string is simply an array of characters ending with a null or zero. For now, we will focus on strings too. Later, we will consider format string attacks and in the process see how the idea of a buffer is actually quite general. An overflow occurs when the program tries to write more data to a buffer than it can actually hold. This term is evocative of data running off the end of the buffer, but once again the idea is really more general. Basically, whenever the program tries to use a variable to access memory that doesn't belong to that variable, for example by indexing an array out of its bounds, the program is performing a kind of overflow. An important question is, what happens when the program reads or writes to a buffer outside its bounds? According to the C programming language standard, such a program is undefined. Effectively, it is allowed to do anything. In a move positive for security, the compiler could choose to insert code to detect out-of-bounds accesses and terminate the program when they occur. Instead, most compilers simply assume the program does not have any overflows and so the program will access whatever memory happens to be at the accessed location. By knowing how memory is laid out, an attacker can use out-of-bounds accesses to his advantage. Let's look at what could happen if a buffer overflow takes place. Here we have a function func and the function main which calls this function with the string authme. Inside of the function, it tries to copy the string authme into a buffer. But probably you can see the problem here. The string has seven characters plus a null terminator whereas the buffer in the local function only allots four characters. And so we're going to overflow that buffer when we call stir copy. Let's see this depicted on the stack. First, when calling func, we see arg1. Then we see the instruction pointer that we saved from the caller. And we see the frame pointer. Then we see the buffer four bytes that we allocated inside of func. Now we see the stir copy works and it's going to copy the first four characters. Then it's going to copy more characters and overwrite the frame pointer with the rest. When we get to the end of the function, we're going to try to follow the same process we always do to return to the calling function main. But of course the frame pointer is now corrupted. So it's going to set it to whatever this strange value is and we're going to segmentation fault when we subsequently use that frame pointer, for example, when accessing a local variable in the caller. Now, normally, we just think, oh, that's a crash. There are bugs in the program. This is one of them. Who cares? Eventually, we'll discover it and we'll fix it. Well, buffer overflows are security relevant. If we modify the function func as follows, we can see that it can have security implications on the program when the buffer is overflowed. We've allocated a new local variable, authenticated. And throughout the function func, we assume that authenticated should be set only if, in fact, authentication has really taken place. Perhaps this will happen after a stir copy. Now let's see what happens with our buffer overflow this time. So when calling func, we push arg1, then the instruction pointer, then the frame pointer, and we've allocated the local variable authenticated and the local variable buffer. And now the stir copy takes place. And this time, instead of overwriting the frame pointer, we overwrite the contents of the authenticated variable. Now this is a problem because every time we go to check authenticated, the value is non-zero and the check is going to succeed. So this mistake had a security relevant outcome by allowing the program to do things that probably we didn't intend. Could it be worse than this? Well in fact, if we think about it, stir copy gives us the ability to copy any amount of data into a buffer that's not the right size. So basically we could overwrite lots of memory on the stack. And the question is, what could you do with that ability if you were an attacker? 
Well, as we'll see, one thing the attacker can do is overwrite the buffer with code and arrange for the program to execute that code when it returns from the function. Now, before we see how that works, as an aside, let me point out that these examples are providing their own strings simply as constants. But in reality, the issue is that strings come from users, some of those users malicious. For example, they could come as textual input, they could come as packets or environment variables, or input from files. It's very important that we validate our assumptions about user input. That is, we want to make sure that the input, for example, is not too long, or that it conforms to a certain structure that the program assumes. We'll discuss in validating input assumptions later and throughout the course, because it turns out to be a problem that programs make all of the time, not just with buffer overflows. Now let's look at the main idea of code injection using a buffer overflow. Recall our function func and, in this case, using sprintf to copy into buffer. There are two main challenges for code injection. The first is somehow using the program to load your own code into memory, and the second is somehow getting the instruction pointer to point to it so that that code can be executed. So let's look at the first challenge, loading code into memory. The first thing to keep in mind is that this code must be the machine code instructions that that machine is prepared to run. In other words, it's not going to be C source code, but instead it's going to be the actual assembly language for the target architecture. Moreover, it can't be just any assembly language. We have to be careful about how we construct it. So for example, it cannot contain any all zero bytes. Why is this? Well, stir copy, sprintf, gets, scanf, and various other unsafe calls that we might like to exploit will only copy data that doesn't have zeros in it. That is, it will copy from the start of a source buffer, buffer up until it reaches zero and then stop. Therefore, if we want to inject a lot of code, we have to make sure that all of that con code contains no zeros. Next, we need to be careful that the code is complete. It can't assume that it can use the loader to, say, resolve memory addresses inside of the program. Instead, it has to be completely self-contained. What code should we try to run? Well, we want to try to run a general purpose shell in the best case. A general purpose shell is a command line prompt that provides the attacker general access to the system. You may want to do other things with the code you inject, but this is sort of the best case. Code that launches a shell as part of an attack is called shellcode. Here's what the shellcode you might like to write might look like. It's a simple function that calls execve, which effectively transforms the current program into the one given as an argument. In this case, the argument is bin sh, a shell. Here's some assembly for this shellcode. If we look at the first instruction, this is what it might look like as a string. This would be the string that you provide as part of your input. The second challenge is getting the injected code to run. Just because we loaded the code in doesn't mean we can get the pointer, the program, to jump to your code whenever you like. Moreover, you don't know precisely where your code is with respect to the instruction pointer. Somehow we have to get it at the start and start running. Now, recall the memory layout summary for the calling and returning from functions. How could we use this setup to our advantage to inject code? Here's the key. The very last step jumps back to the location of the return address, which was saved on the stack. Therefore, we can store the address of our code at that location, and therefore, get the program to jump to that code. That's the main trick. Here's what it looks like visually. We load in the address of our code over top of EIP saved on the stack. Therefore, when the function returns, it's going to return exactly to that location and then start running the code. Now the next question is, what address should we put there? How will we know what the address is?
Well, maybe thinking of the question another way, we can ask, what if we get the address wrong? If we pick the wrong address and jump to some other location, most likely the CPU will panic because it will reach an invalid instruction, therefore crashing the program. Another challenge that adversaries sometimes face is finding the return address. Now, if the adversary knows the code that he is trying to attack and knows exactly where the buffer overrun is, he might know exactly where the buffer is with respect to the frame pointer and therefore where the return address is located. Therefore, he knows what the location is to overwrite to get his code to be run. On the other hand, the adversary may not have access to the code and may not know how far an overrun buffer is from the saved frame pointer. One approach is trial and error. Just try a lot of different injected values on a running server until something works. But of course, the address space is quite large and maybe this won't really work. On the other hand, without address randomization, which is something we'll discuss later, the stack always starts from the same fixed address. The stack will grow, but usually it doesn't grow very deeply unless the code is heavily recursive. This reduces the search base dramatically. Another thing the adversary can do is use what is called a no-op sled. A no-op is a single byte instruction that just moves to the next instruction. If the adversary sticks a bunch of no-ops as padding prior to his own code, then jumping anywhere in that no-op sled will work. Now we can improve our chances by a factor of number of no-ops. So putting it all together, here's what all of the injected adversarial code might look like. This part labeled padding has to be something because we have to start writing wherever the input to gets or sprintf or stir copy begins. But when the program returns to the picked location, it'll hit the no-op sled and start running our malicious code. The attack we have just deconstructed is called a stack smashing attack. The term was coined by the hacker with the handle Aleph1 in his famous 1996 article in Frack Magazine titled Smashing the Stack for Fun and Profit, which you can still find online. The reason for the name is obvious. The attack overwrites, or smashes, important data on the stack to enable illicit actions. Revisiting the three security properties we briefly discussed in the introductory lecture, confidentiality, integrity, and availability, we can see that stack smashing is a violation of integrity. The attack has corrupted important data in the program and enabled further corruption of data on the system by allowing arbitrary code to run on behalf of the attacker. Stack smashing can also reduce availability by simply crashing the program or injecting code to make it unresponsive. For the remainder of this unit, we will take a brief look at other attacks that are a variation of stack smashing. They too will take advantage of bugs involving the use of memory, but they will consider memory allocated in different places, and they may read memory illicitly rather than write to it. Another sort of attack is a heap overflow attack. While stack smashing overflows a stack allocated buffer, you can also overflow a buffer allocated by malloc, which resides on the heap. This code gives an example. At the top, we define a struct, vulnerable struct, that has two fields. The first is buff, a character pointer. The second is the compare function pointer. Below, we see a function foo that takes a vulnerable struct as an argument, along with two character pointer arguments. To begin, the first line of the function copies one into buff. The second line copies two past one into buff. Finally, the third line calls the compare function pointer, passing buff as an argument, and comparing it against the foo bar file pointer. Now, you may have noticed that this code is only going to work properly if the string length of 1 and 2 is less than the maximum length of the buffer into which they were copied. Otherwise, we will overwrite the compare function pointer. Just as when we overwrite the return address in a stack smashing attack, 
the adversary may be able to control how this overwrite happens and get the program to run code of his choice. There are many variants of this basic heap overflow attack. One variation applies to programs written in C++, which extends C with support for object-oriented programming. C++ objects consist of data and methods, as defined by a class. Classes support inheritance, so a method in a parent class can be overridden by a method defined in inheriting child class. C++ supports subtype polymorphism, so that a child class's object can be used where a parent class object is expected. As a result, the compiler cannot be sure whether an object declared to have a type T really does have type T or has a type that inherits from T. To handle this situation, all objects are compiled to have what is called a V table. This is an array containing pointers to the code of each of the object's methods. The code used to call a method simply indexes the V table using a fixed offset that corresponds to the desired method. Now, for this to work, the V table has to be at a standard location within an object. Wherever it happens to be, the fields containing the object's data are nearby. If one of those fields is subject to a buffer overflow, then the V table could be corrupted and a method function pointer overwritten. This is analogous to the situation we just saw with the vulnerable struct in C. Both this and the earlier attack we saw overflowed a buffer into another field of the same object. An alternative is to overflow into an adjacent object, for example, one containing a function pointer. This is more challenging because the attacker may need to work to get the right kind of object nearby the one he can overflow, but it can be done. A related attack aims to overflow not a program object, but instead the metadata that malloc uses to keep track of heap allocated memory. Oftentimes, the memory just before the pointer returned from malloc contains a header. This header may contain pointers, for example, linking the returned object into a list of allocated data. Data not currently in use by the program will be linked in a free list instead. By corrupting this data, an attacker can cause the code implementing malloc and free to carry out actions to his advantage. Another sort of attack that's often considered in its own right is an integer overflow attack. These attacks rely on the fact that in C, a variable has a maximum value, and when that value is exceeded, the variable's value will wrap around. In this case, we're reading in from the network using the packet getInt function. Suppose that the adversary has control of the other side of the network and is sending a very large number. In fact, suppose the number is 1,073,741,824 and that the size of a character pointer on our architecture is 4. In other words, it's a 32-bit architecture. Obviously, nresp is greater than 0, and so we will malloc a buffer into which we store a response. Now, the adversary has arranged it so that this very large number times 4 wraps around to 0. Many malloc implementations will happily allocate a size 0 buffer, and then the subsequent writes to that buffer are overflowing it. Of course, just as in all of the other attacks that we have seen, this overflow may be controllable so that the adversary can inject code or otherwise have his way. Many of the attacks we have shown so far affect code, return addresses, and function pointers, but we can also affect data as well. For example, the attacker might overrun a buffer to modify a secret key to be one known to him and therefore he can decrypt future intercepted messages using that key. He might also modify state variables to bypass authorization checks. For example, we showed this with the authenticated flag when first introducing the idea of buffer overflows. He might also modify interpreted strings used as part of subsequent commands sent to other programs. For example, server programs that communicate with databases will often do so using SQL, SQL commands may be overwritten by buffer overflows to get the attacker access to arbitrary portions of the database. 
So far, we've just been interested in what happens when you write past the end of a buffer. But a bug could also permit reading past the end of the buffer. This might leak secret information. As an example, consider, the, consider this program. The program is going to read in to buff from standard in, then it will echo back the number of characters specified. Here, we're reading in an integer. We first read into the buffer and then call the a2i function to convert the contents of that buffer, a string, into an integer length. Next, we read in a message. Finally, we echo back that message by iterating up to the length specified, printing out the characters one at a time. Where's the problem? The problem is that the length that was specified in the first read may exceed the length of the message provided in the second read. If it does, it's going to print out characters beyond what was read in. Here's an example run of this program. We start the server, enter in a number, and then enter a message. In this case, the number does correspond to the length of the message, and the program echoes back the message as expected. Here, the number is slightly less than the length of the message, and as expected, fewer characters are returned. Here, the number is greater than the length of the message, and we can see that extra data is printed out beyond what was entered. This data is leaked. It was whatever was read in previously. The Heartbleed bug is an example of a high-profile buffer overflow discovered in early 2014 that involves reading data rather than writing it. By some estimates, Heartbleed affected nearly 600,000 servers on the internet. The bug was in the implementation of the so-called heartbeat functionality of the SSL protocol. This functionality allows a client to send a heartbeat message to the server, asking it to respond back to confirm the connection is still active. The heartbeat message contains a length field that indicates the length of the portion of the message to echo back. The bug in the SSL server was that it did not check the length was accurate. In fact, it could be much longer than the heartbeat message itself. By specifying a long length, the attacker could get the buggy server to read beyond the buffer containing the heartbeat message, and therefore return whatever was in nearby memory. Depending on the activities of the server prior to the overflow, nearby memory could contain things of interest to the attacker, such as passwords, cryptographic keys, or other items specific to the server using SSL. Another interesting memory bug occurs when dealing with stale memory. A dangling pointer bug occurs when a pointer is freed, but the program continues to use it. An attacker may be able to arrange for the freed memory to be reallocated, and then under his control, prior to the program using the pointer that was previously freed. So here's an example at the bottom. We have a struct again with a com uh, compare character po or a function pointer in it. Here we allocate it, and then free it. Now, suppose some time goes by, and malloc is called, and it reuses the memory that we just freed, allocating it now to this buffer pointed to by Q. Q stores to it some random value. Worse, maybe the attacker can control what was stored to the value using Q. Now, later on, the program reuses P, despite the fact that it freed it, by calling the compare function pointer. And in this case, it has to reference the dangling pointer and is going to go straight to the memory that the attacker put there. In fact, it was just this sort of bug that played a huge role in the attack that China had on Google back in 2010. An invalid pointer was accessed after an object was deleted in Internet Explorer. The final category of buffer overflow style attack we will consider is called a format string attack. It is named for the format strings used by the printf family of library functions in the standard C library. A format string is typically the first or one of the first arguments to a printf style function, and the remaining variable number of arguments comprise the data to be printed. Format strings use what are called format specifiers to indicate how data should be formatted. 
For example, the code snippet shown here prints out a record consisting of an individual's name and age. The first format specifier applies to the first argument following the format string, and the second specifier applies to the second argument. In this case, the first argument is a string, and the second is an integer. There are also many other kinds of specifiers, too. Now let's see how a simple misunderstanding of how format strings should be used can lead to a serious vulnerability. Now, we might wonder, what's the difference between this function and this function? We can see that on the first two lines, the functions are identical. They allocate a character buffer on the stack, and they call fgets to read into it. The difference is on the third line. The first function calls %s as a format string prior to printing buff, whereas the second function forgoes using a format string altogether and just places buff there. Now, we might think to ourselves, Buff is just a string in both cases, so why do I need the format string? Well, the important part is that buff might itself contain format specifiers. In the first case, if it does, those specifiers will just be printed out to the screen. In the second, those will be interpreted. If the attacker controls the format string, then the interpretation of those format specifiers can work to his advantage. So let's look at how printf is implemented and see how that might happen. Here we see a call to printf. It's going to print out i and its address using the %d and %p format specifiers. The first is for printing an integer. The second is for printing out a pointer. Here's what the stack might look like with the topmost address range to the right and the stack growing from right to left as usual. We can see the arguments on the stack. First of all, the ampersand i argument, the i argument, and the format string pushed in reverse order. Printf takes a variable number of arguments and pays no mind to where the stack frame actually ends. It presumes that when you called it, you passed in at least the number of arguments specified in the format string. Here we have percent %d, which corresponds to the argument 10, and here we have percent %p that corresponds to the argument ampersand %i, so everything is well. Now let's go back to our vulnerable function. Suppose we passed in the format string %d %x, and notice that there are no additional arguments provided. In this case, the stack will look as follows. We'll have just pushed the format string argument, and that's all. Now when printf goes to interpret that string, it will read from the caller's stack frame the %d portion, and then will read again for the %x portion. Let's think about some other format strings and what might happen. This format string will print out the four bytes above the saved instruction pointer. Why is that? Well, it turns out that printf ignores any spaces between the percent and the format uh, character that's used in the specifier, in this case, percent %d. In this case, it's going to print out the bytes pointed to by this stack entry. So it's going to look one pass the saved EIP interpret that four bytes as a pointer, go to that memory address, and then print out the entire contents until it reaches a null terminator. This will print out a series of stack entries as integers, and this format string will print them, print them out as hex. Now here's the really terrible one. This one will actually write the number three to the address pointed to by the stack entry. Why is that? Well, %n is a format specifier that is used to write the progress that printf has made in printing out to the output stream. In this case, it will have printed three characters, 1, 0, 0, and so it will print the number 3 to whatever the argument is on the stack. It's expecting to receive uh, an integer right for, uh, corresponding to the %n, but it's not actually going to get one. Instead, it's going to overwrite the stack entry instead. And as you might suspect, this is going to allow the attacker to do a remote code injection in certain circumstances. So you might ask yourself, why is a format string attack like a buffer overflow? Well, we should think of it as a buffer overflow in the sense that the stack itself can be viewed as a kind of buffer. That is, all of the arguments defined by a function define a kind of buffer and bounds. The size of that buffer is determined by the number and size of the arguments passed to the function. So providing a bogus format string thus induces the program to overflow the buffer as defined by the arguments. 
This vulnerability has been around for quite a while and continues to happen despite people knowing about it. Now that we have seen the wide variety of buffer overflow style attacks that exist, it's time to trade our black hat for a white one to see about how to defend against them. In our next unit, we will step back and look more carefully at what these attacks have in common. Then we will look at a variety of different defenses and evaluate their effectiveness. In essence, we will chronicle the cat and mouse game played by attacker and defender over the last couple of decades. By the end, we will see that, unfortunately, when programming in C, the attacker still largely has the upper hand. Fortunately, it is far more difficult today to generate an exploit than it used to be, and new methods for avoiding buffer overflow vulnerabilities are being developed.